Today I want to talk about all the things that I wish that I knew at the beginning of my software engineering career. I do want to preface this by saying that this is what has worked for me. You do not need to do every single one of these things and they are not going to define your success. But I do think that they may help some other people, which is why I want to put them out there. I'm going to talk about my advice for the job search for interviews, code challenges that you may get in the interview process, and for things to do on the job so that you can be ready for the next time that you search. So let's talk about the job search. First off, there are so many niches within tech and within software engineering or web development. There are so many different fields that you can go into, like front-end development or being an accessibility specialist or working in mostly JavaScript or being a back-end developer, DevOps. There are so many more even from that. And then within there, there are so many different company types that you could work for as well, whether that be agencies, startups, big tech, etc. So find an area that you're interested in and want to specialize in so that you can tailor your experiences and application materials to those types of roles. The next thing is to put down your priorities. So what are the things that are most important to you at a workplace? Is it work-life balance? Is it the compensation rate? Is it that you're doing fun things on the job and that you're able to learn? Think about the things that you prioritize most and write them down because during the job search, you might get a little bit hazy or you might be seeing so many different companies and you might go for one just because it feels really exciting. And there's some validity to that for sure, but make sure that you come back to those things that you value most and make sure that that company is going to align with those goals and those priorities. Everyone has different interests and things that they think are important, so make sure that you prioritize what is most important to you. Another thing to prioritize and think about is finding an employer that wants you to succeed. Management makes or breaks pretty much any role and make sure that your future manager is somebody that you feel will facilitate your growth. Another piece of advice is that even if there aren't jobs posted on a website, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. So I got my first job in tech by reaching out to a company and saying that my skills aligned with what they did. They didn't have open roles on their website or anything like that. And just because there is not a job that like, perfectly fits you on their website doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. Feel empowered to reach out by either emailing or using social media to connect with somebody and see if there are positions that may fit your interests, even if they're not listed. Of course, do some research first. Don't just spam people or anything like that. But if you see a company that's really great, but maybe doesn't have something that's perfect, you can still reach out or still apply and see what happens. My next piece of advice is that oftentimes online applications are a black hole. I have hired for developer positions in the past. And something that I've noticed is that for any role, you're going to pretty much get hundreds of applicants, especially if it's a junior level role. And so something that's really important to do is to have some sort of personal connection with somebody on the team or somebody in a hiring position so that your resume or your application gets bumped to the top of the stack. So I'll talk a little bit about networking at the end of this video, but it's so important to do that because it's so hard to get through online applications. Another thing that I really prioritize is making a portfolio that stands out. In your early career, especially if you are a boot camp or self-taught developer, it's going to be really helpful to have that because it's going to be the landing place for all the information about you, your past experiences, your portfolio projects, the technologies that you're interested in, and it allows you to say a lot about yourself. So you can have a really great bio, you can talk about what you're looking for, and it says more about you than your resume, in my opinion. So I would really focus on making that portfolio site stand out and be really awesome. I would love to make more content and portfolio sites in the future. If you're interested in that, please leave a comment below and I will make sure to get to that. Another thing that I've seen that I really like on certain people's portfolio is a searching page. And what this has on it is all the things that you are looking for in a job. 
a target salary range, a location, uh, values that line up with what is important to them, and other priorities that they have when they are looking for a job. And I think this is really great because the application process is a two-way street. It's not just that a company is looking for an employee, but you also have to look at the company that's going to be the best fit for you and going to foster your growth. So I love this idea of having a page that employers that have roles that line up with what you're looking for could reach out to you potentially. I think this is especially important if you are freelancing or anything like that. I'm not doing consulting work right now, but I do have a page on my website that talks all about working with me and the different services that I offer as a freelancer and the different stipulations that I have for working with me, as it sounds like. So I highly recommend this because the values have to align in both directions and it also gives a clear outline for your expectations in a role. So that's my advice for the searching phase, just gathering companies that you're interested in looking at and reaching out to them and the pre-interview stage of the process. Now let's talk about interviews. So there are normally a couple different rounds of interviews at tech companies. So most often what I've seen is first off a phone screen where the recruiter reaches out to you and these are usually non-technical. They just ask you what you're looking for in a role and they ask for your experiences and they see if they have any roles that line up well and see if you on a very high level would be a good fit for their company. If so, you usually move on to a next phase first stage interview. At some companies, this is with your hiring manager and is another non-technical step. At other companies, this is a technical stage where you are being asked code questions. Sometimes you get a code challenge after or before this step, and we'll talk about those in a minute as well. After that, you normally move on to the on-site, which is usually a full day of interviews. Right now, because of the coronavirus, most of these are being done remotely, but this is the big day of interviews where you have both technical and non-technical interviews and usually after this phase you'll either get the offer or get rejected. So those are the typical steps. It does look different at different companies but that's a little bit about what interviewing looks like as a software developer. So some pieces of advice for this. If the company is making you go through a ton of hoops and the interviews are incredibly difficult for a role that doesn't sound like the interview really aligns. That's a red flag that the company might be making you go through too much and it might not be a great company to work for to be totally honest. So I think that a really difficult interview process that's really clunky and maybe they're forgetting about interview sessions with you or they're taking a really long time to respond or you're having to do like 18 rounds of interviews, those are all red flags that working at that company might not be the best fit. One other thing is that you are not going to know the answer most likely to every single question. In most cases, they're going to ask you increasingly difficult questions over the course of your interview. So at some point, you most likely will not know something. And it's important to admit that, especially if the question is really far outside of your span of knowledge. So one example is if somebody asks you if you know React and if you do know React to explain what it is and you have not used React, say that you don't know it yet, but you do know Vue and jQuery, which will give you the fundamental skills that you need to learn React down the road and you love learning, so would be really excited to look, pick it up on the job. So that shows that you have a growth mindset, that you have other technical skills that would align even though that one technical skill isn't there. And it's turning, uh, could be negative if not knowing something that they're asking about into more of a positive. You can always describe your thought process as well. So if you don't know the answer to a question, you can start talking through it and if it's like a whiteboard type situation where they're asking you to solve technical problems, you can start writing pseudocode and think about the different pitfalls and benefits of the approach that you're trying to take. So it's not going to be expected that you do know everything. It's more trying to see your thought process and seeing what your mindset is around solving difficult problems. So show that you are there to grow and learn and show your thinking process. Another piece of this is to not undervalue your non-technical experience if you have that. So if you are a career changer 
So you're going from teaching to coding or something along those lines. Know that your past experiences are still valid and helpful for your career. So you can still use those and channel them and incorporate them into your interview responses. Don't forget about them and don't undervalue them because I know it's tempting to. So my last piece of advice for the interview is after you actually get the offer, and that is to always negotiate. So even if an offer looks really great, there's almost always wiggle room to come up and it's pretty much expected that you do negotiate. So make sure to do that. I know that early on in my career, I was way too afraid to, but it's so important to do so. And most good employers are not going to reject you just because you try to negotiate. You don't always have to negotiate for compensation either. So you can try to negotiate for more time off or different work hours. I like working like seven to three days instead of nine to five mostly. And so I have negotiated that into past work contracts. So make sure to negotiate in order to get the offer to where you want it to be. So the formula that I follow in negotiation, first I thank them for the offer. I tell them what I would like to change in that offer letter. I then give the justification for why I believe that I'm either qualified for that jump in salary or that the current offer isn't what I need. And then I tell them how I plan on helping their company and the things that I plan on doing at work that justify that compensation level. And then I sign off. So hopefully that might help you as well if you are trying to negotiate. But that's something that I really wish that I had done earlier in my career because I think that I let myself be underpaid because I did not negotiate. On a related note, never tell that future employer or the interviewer how much you currently make. That's going to put you in a bad position for negotiating. And actually in a lot of states, in the United States, it's illegal to ask your salary. So note that. The next piece of the puzzle is the code challenge. And this usually happens somewhere in the interview process. I'm gonna speak specifically about take home challenges. So most companies will give you either a GitHub repository or like a hacker rank problem or something along those lines. And you have to write code in order to solve their problem. Some of these are timed and some of these are not timed. So the timed ones you'll get an hour or two to work through this problem. You have like a clock on it and it won't work after that time slot. And then otherwise you can work on your own time, but make sure that these are scoped because it's not really fair if they're asking you to do essentially a freelance project for free. So you shouldn't be spending absolutely forever on these. At a couple previous employers, I've been in charge of reviewing code challenges. So I specifically wanted to speak to this because I see a lot of people leaving opportunity on the table with these. So the first thing is to read the instructions. And that may sound like obvious advice, but I cannot tell you what percentage of people miss some sort of instruction or turn in the wrong thing. And that just doesn't look great. So make sure that you read through the instructions probably multiple times. Feel free to ask your contact questions about the code challenge if something isn't clear to you or the instructions don't make sense. I also would highly recommend reading the instructions again before you submit the code challenge so that you can make sure that you actually did everything in the instructions. You can even make a checklist for yourself based off of them. Like here are the three things that I need, put them all on a separate to-do. And also follow best practices for your language. Use clear variable names, format things properly. You'd think that this would be a given, but I've seen so many people not do it, so I think it's worth mentioning. And another thing is just because you don't finish the code challenge doesn't mean you're necessarily eliminated. So still submit it even if you don't finish. You can submit an explanation with it of here's what I would have done if I had more time, or here's the pseudocode for the rest, but I couldn't complete it because of X and Y reason. Here are some tips for on the job so that when you're there, you can either work towards a promotion or towards achieving your next position. I keep a knowledge repository and what that is, is just my notes on different topics. I use Foam, which is this really great Visual Studio Code extension that allows you to organize your notes and link in between them. So I will link that down below. I also track my wins for a couple different reasons. It's helpful for imposter syndrome if I'm feeling that. It's also helpful for when you are looking to be promoted or 
at annual review time. So I keep a log every day of the things that I'm doing, the things that I'm putting out, and some statistics on them. I think that that's something that can be really helpful for both you and your manager. Another thing is to always challenge yourself. So I think as programmers, a big part of what we do is wanting to keep increasing our knowledge and keep learning and growing and doing things that are challenging. And overall, most of us get bored kind of easily if we're not being challenged. And so I personally will institute new challenges for myself if I'm not being challenged enough at, on the job. So at my first job, I had a lot of leeway with what I was doing. I challenged myself to write test coverage for all of my code, even though that was not required by the company. I also challenged myself to follow Sandy Metz's rules for software development for a while, which are fun but super challenging that each method or function needs to be five lines of code or less. That's the most challenging one for me at least. Or you can ask your supervisor for something that's a little bit more difficult or outside your comfort zone so that you can keep extending your knowledge, which will be helpful in the future. And most of the time to get promoted, you have to show pretty much that you're doing that role already. So take on as much responsibility as you can with that in reason without burning yourself out or being overwhelmed. On the flip side of that is make sure that you don't get burnt out. This is something that I've dealt with, especially with the amount of side work that I do. It's so important to have balance and take time for yourself. Don't work all the time. It can be tempting too, but make sure that you work an achievable schedule for yourself. Another thing is to not tolerate toxicity. So there are some companies that treat employees really, really poorly, especially if you're from an underrepresented background in tech. And it's really important to know that that's not your fault. That's the employer's fault and that there are other companies out there to work with. Yes, the job search is often really, really difficult and not a fun thing to go through, but oftentimes it is worth it to get out of that toxic environment. Your health and safety is so much more important than loyalty to a company. I feel like a broken record on this one, but getting involved in the developer community was the most meaningful thing that I've done for my career. So even just writing occasional blog posts or going to a meetup every couple of months or joining a Slack group that you can message during the day on your technology of choice, all of those things build bonds for yourself within your tech community and will forge relationships for when you're searching in the future. And along the same lines, networking is often a dirty word and something that I personally struggle with because I do not like the inauthentic nature that it often takes on. But I think that the best way to network is to make relationships and friends within your industry when you're not searching and when you don't need anything. And then those relationships could pay off once you need them. So do not make those relationships solely for the purpose of getting a job, but down the road, those relationships can really pay off for your career. Every job that I've gotten has been through connections at that company rather than approaching them cold. So I cannot say enough how important it is to forge relationships within your field. I hope some of these career tips were helpful for you. If they were, if you can go ahead and give this channel a thumbs up so that other people can see it, that would be amazing. And subscribe to the channel so you can hear about my next videos. See you next week.